Hello and welcome to another Creative Futures session here at Glendua University, where I'm joined by Namon Metaxas, who is a broadcaster, presenter, DJ and psychotherapist. Namon, welcome to Glendua University Creative Futures. Oh, it's really good to be here. Thank you for asking me, Graham. I'm really excited to be part of Creative Futures with you guys. Well, the reason I've asked you is because of your, your background in broadcasting and, and hopefully we'd like to talk about the psychotherapy later as well. But we, you and I worked together uh, in the mid 90s, early to mid 90s. I met you when we worked at KISS 102 uh, radio station yeah. in Manchester. I was a DJ and presenter. You started off on reception, but then ended I up being, I mean, how would you describe what you did? You interviewed people basically, didn't you, for our, for our, yeah. um, for a magazine show? Yeah, I, I produced and presented the entertain the nightly entertainment kind of roundup show, which I suppose these days wouldn't have much of a place because of the social media we have and the ways in which people keep in touch. But actually at the time um, was a really important place to find out what was happening in music, to hear interviews, longer form interviews um, with some of the favorite DJs that we had at KISS and people like that, so yeah. And of course, um, you did psychology at university, yes? I did, yeah. But your first job was as a receptionist at a radio station. And then, as you said, you, you then interviewed people. And, and some quite, I remember, some quite well-known people, some quite famous people, not just um, music people, but, but showbiz and entertainment people coming into our studios and you um, interviewing them. But you, you were you trained to be a psych a psychologist or, or you, you, yeah. you did a psychology degree. How did you learn? Where did you get your uh, training and craft? How did you learn to become an interviewer? Well, I had um, always had a love of music. I was surrounded by what I, what I guess you'd call bedroom DJs at home. In, I grew up in Cambridge, actually, in my teens. Um, and then knew I wanted to escape to a bigger city for more experience and quite a lot of clubbing. Uh, so headed off to Manchester and that's where I studied psychology. So I stayed within the city and I was pursuing a career as a clinical psychologist when I heard the advert on KISS for a, um, I think it was a promotions manager actually. And I'd put on some nights at the university, uh, went for the job, woefully underqualified uh, but really got on with the people that I was chatting to and interviewing for and they said look we can't give you the promotion manager job but we really like you we'll keep your details on file and I rang back about three months later and said look what you know what's going on is there anything and they said well the only thing that we've got is receptionist and I said I'll take it and I was still in Manchester still living in a, in a house with various of my student friends um, and working on reception during the day at KISS and then a bar job at the Athenaeum. Do you remember the Athenaeum? I do well, indeed, we yes. we had some brilliant dancers on podiums at the, the door and then, uh, well, it was a great bar, uh, sort of pre-bar to Sankey Soap and Golden that you played uh, plenty of. Um, and then I, I would, um, on the during the week, I would, uh, I, I got to know quite a few people at the radio station. I mean, I was at sales and, and um, reception initially, so I was typing up people's sales reports and I happened <laughs> to say to someone, can you pass me the Tipex? Again, something that's slightly redundant these days. We don't really have it, but uh, it was a kind of fluid that you used to kind of um, paint over so you could write over something in pen. Mm -hmm. And um, and somebody said, oh, say that again. And I said, can you pass me the Tipex? And they said, right, can you voice this advert for this nightclub called Climax at Millennium? So <laughs> Climax is the name of the night. And the club was Millennium, which I think was in Bolton. Um, and, it was, yeah. And... Um, at that point, I was like, oh, well, I might be able to earn a few bob out of my voice. So I started to do a few adverts. And then I got to know the people who were kind of in the technical side of the radio station. And I would stay after my stint on reception and writing sales reports and learn from our friend Neil, actually, who was uh, then working on the entertainment show, um, how all the equipment worked. And I was I was kind of I had this voracious. I, I, couldn't wait to once I got in the studio and I saw what you and the likes of David Dunn were doing I I felt at home in a studio and I just wanted to know how it worked I wanted to be able to play records I wanted I just kind of wanted more of it but it meant 
12 hour days of doing reception, staying behind and then going and doing my bar job, but I did it. So, I mean, what I'm getting from that is you took the receptionist job to get a foot in the door and then you learned yeah. everything on the job. Now, the, the difference is now, I mean, in those days, you couldn't go to university and learn radio production, but you can now. And we've got studio students here who, who, who want to do this. But the, the, land, the radio landscape's different. Um, yeah. For example, KISS was independent. Yeah. And all there was, used to be loads of independent radio stations around the country that, that were all independently owned and did their own thing. But now, of course, three major companies own every radio station and they network shows. So one presenter on 17 stations, for example. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to someone today in the 21st century with that new landscape to... to to, to try and do what you did when the opportunities maybe aren't there? Well, I think different opportunities are available these days. I mean, I'm not saying that that doesn't make it harder. I think, I think the landscape has changed, but I think there are also different opportunities. I still think radio stations need people to produce, to help run them, be enthusiastic people. And I've seen that from being at the BBC, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a huge organization. We do have uh, a reduced workforce from when I started 20 years ago at the BBC, but still freelancers are part of the landscape and, um, you know, answering the phones on a Jeremy Vine show, uh, coming in and editing pieces of audio on, you know, for a show like Giles, working for some of the independent production companies that then produce shows for the BBC. And that could be anything from running to making the tea to being on reception. And then you are in a building where you are meeting people. And I don't think um, you can really overstate the, when you meet people in this industry, you are making a contact. I know the, the word network has such a, a kind of, it's not great, is it? And, it? and people don't like the idea of networking as such. But it, in effect, it means that you are establishing a network at every single stage in your career. So that could be the fact that Graham Park is your tutor, the fact that you have attended, well, the fact that you've attended oh, yeah. Creative Futures where we're talking, then, then enables you to email and say, oh, Namone, you know, I saw you talking to Graham. Can I ask you a question? That kind of... Um, approach. I mean, I, I, to give you a couple of examples, when I started working at the BBC and I, the, the first show I did after working at KISS was a Saturday breakfast show. So I was on one day a week. I'd had to move down to London. I was doing a three hour show um, at, and I was kind of meeting people uh, through, you know, working at the station. And then I had an agent. So I'd meet people there. And that's, you know, that happened to be people like Derm O'Leary and it happened to be people like Russell Brand and then was able to do other stuff through, you know, Celebrity Big Brother, which Dermot produced, uh, Dermot presented, I then ended up going on. So all those networks helped. But the people who were, so I, I knew a, a somebody on the trainee scheme at the BBC when I started that Saturday breakfast show, now heads up Six Music. The person who was helping out on Chris Moyles' breakfast show, and that's Alid, is now heading up Radio One. So it, you can kind of see that actually those pathways do exist and have existed all the way through, but it's from the it's from the get go. You are making contacts from the moment you start working or you start approaching people. And I'm not saying it's easy, but it just requires that kind of bigger landscape view rather than I'm just going to go and talk to this person about this one job. Now you're absolutely right, and of course that's when your attitude and being professional is important as well. Because if you were to really rub someone up the wrong way and then they end up being someone that you want to approach, then you might um, have to be do a bit of groveling, wouldn't you? Well, I think, I think the, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you never want to burn bridges, but you also don't want to be taken advantage of. And I think it's a, it, you know, it's kind of to, um, no, to have an idea of your worth, but to also know that hard work does not go unrewarded and you will, you know, in some kind of, um, uh, way find the people who will then employ you I mean I think that talent will always rise and you know decent producers and people who are really enthusiastic they're going to get work because that is always appreciated um, 
I, 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 and the other thing while I'm thinking about it, Graham, is always ask questions. I mean, I know you asked me how I, how I learned in the beginning. I had not a clue. I'd nobody in my family had ever been in entertainment or music or anything. I asked every single person I met, the person who I was working with on reception, you, David, the controller of KISS at the time, uh, the careers office, how, how do I do this? What do I do? Are there any tips? And I was constantly taking on, you know, information and, uh, and advice, I guess. No, that's, that, that, is, that is great advice. You're kind of learning on the hoof. But I mean, in many ways, that's what I've done all my life. You learn um, on the hoof. Um, but the, you're right, the networks, the connections are very important. Let's go, let's go back to, to, to KISS. So you find out you've got a great voice, right, that gets you some voiceover work. You, do, you, you learn to be a reporter and into, uh, interviewing technique. Um, if memory serves me right, didn't, I mean, KISS became Galaxy. I don't know if it was on Galaxy or KISS, but didn't you end up doing a phone-in show on uh, KISS or Galaxy for a while? Yeah, I did. I had... Uh, and was that again. touching on your, your, your training at university? Do you know, at the time, I didn't really, I suppose it was, I mean, I'd done, like you say, a psychology degree. At that point, I was a broadcaster and I was doing quite a lot of late night. I think I was, I did the late night chill out slot on Galaxy and they That's actually right. networked that. That's right. Uh, in Leeds, Manchester and Bristol. And then we cooked up an idea, which was a precursor, actually, to, to the idea that then flew on Radio One, which was a phone in show for people with, uh, with me, broadcaster, DJ, kind of anchoring the show alongside a psychotherapist. And we would we would literally answer the phone in the studio and, and, and vet somebody on to, to go on. And then they would ask a question and the psychotherapist, the therapist would answer. Um, and I suppose it's a it, it is a pre it was a kind of step in the way to, to some of the stuff that I'm doing now. Definitely. And of course, um, again, a show like that wouldn't pop up on a independent radio station. I would. It's all about selling advertising, but it might pop up on a on a community station. Well, it might do, and, and, and you might be able to make a podcast out of it. I mean, that's, that's how the landscape has changed immeasurably, Graham. We only had those radio stations to go to for work. And there wasn't a, th you know, it was very difficult to imagine how you would um, broadcast yourself if you weren't finding a place on one of these platforms. And at the time, when we think of lots of independent stations, but a lot of the, the local radio was BBC, and then you had the big kind of network stations, um, but there weren't many other places where if you had an idea, you could just go and do it, and now you can. So that yes. show could, could be made as a podcast now. Um, and I think um, it's not easy. There isn't a lot of immediately available funding in podcasting, but certainly in terms of creativity and learning and honing your craft, that is a brilliant place to do it. Yeah, which is why a lot of the students who are watching today are actually making a podcast uh, as a, 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 a group as group work that's assessed. And that's that's one of the reasons why we're talking to you. So to tell me, let's jump from uh, Kiss in Manchester and you ended up on Radio One. I mean, first of all, how did you get the gig? And secondly, what were you thinking when you suddenly opening the mic and you're on Radio One? How did that happen? I absolutely petrified and uh and actually i was gonna say that that never leaves you sometimes now when i haven't broadcast live for for a while because i do um quite a few pre-recorded shows that i get those sort of butterflies and nerves and um, well i was gonna t uh, just to go slightly back from that i got my first daytime gig on galaxy because i there weren't any opportunities and i actually ended up going for a job in atlanta at atlantic 252 where our friend was a uh, program controller so that was david who'd moved from kiss ended up program controlling a station that was based in ireland so i went out to ireland looked to, you know talked to david they were going to take me on and i went back to galaxy and said look i'm leaving i've got i've got this gig that i'm now doing you know permanent daytime show and they said don't leave we'll 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 you know we'll match the money so I, I wanted to say that actually sometimes you do have to be prepared to kind of leave the place that yeah. you want to be or um, be prepared to go and get experience elsewhere. Because I was, I wanted to be broadcasting every day. There wasn't the space to do that. So then when I had my job at Galaxy and I've been broadcasting on the, on the morning show, I had, a, um, I had an accountant in Manchester, actually, who said, uh, 
oh, I'm just off down to London to see my, I work for an, I do, do work for an agency. And I was like, oh, who's that? And he said, John Knoll Management. I was like, who do they look after? Davina McCall, Dan O'Leary. I was like, right, do you think you could give them my tape? Do you, do you, would, you, would you do that, Charles? And he was like, oh, I don't know about that. Well, I'll take it down with me and I'll see what happens. He put my tape in front of John Knoll. I then got a call to say, uh, love, love what you're doing. Can we, ha can we have a meeting? And he was actually Manchester based. And I was like, great. Now I happen to have a gig voicing a basketball show in London that weekend that he said, can we meet? And I, I, um, I didn't know London very well. And I'd uh, totally miscalculated the amount of time it was going to take me to get back to Heathrow to fly back to <laughs> Manchester. I got stuck in a record shop in Soho and I got totally lost uh, in time and buying music. Uh, I end up missing the meeting with this agent that I've worked really hard for. And I Ooh. was mortified, absolutely mortified. Got in contact with him immediately, made, groveled, you know, made excuses. I was really lucky. He met me again and then decided to take me on. And wow. it was he and I that then approached Radio uh, One. But get this again. So the person who was controlling at Radio One at the time was Lorna Clark. Lorna Clark had worked at KISS. I had rung her at several times at KISS. I'd seen her, hadn't actually met her at that time, but I'd rung her to say, look, I used to work on KISS. Uh, I'm trying to get to, to, to do more radio. How would you do it? I'd asked advice. I'd sort of approached her as a mentor. Then I get to meet her for this interview. So when you say that the people that you meet along the way are really important, it, it, I can't underline that enough that you will meet them at, you know, several times down the road and you just never know what they might be able to offer or, you know, where they might be at a time that you might need them. No, it, it, exactly. And, and, and picking up on that point, that's why I'm able to get you coming to talk uh, to my, to my, <laughs> to my students at university. So, okay. So you end up at, at Radio One. Um, what, what did you think? Because obviously, it's, it, uh, presumably, it's really was oh. a station you used to grow, you grew up with, and you're now part of the team there. I, and you know, it it was so unbelievable. It was it, I um at the time it, it felt like, and I had this for quite a long time, and I know other people have spoken about it, like I shouldn't really be there, like <laughs> I didn't belong, like actually yeah. I was kind of. Um, an imposter in some way. And I think who, it took me a long time to, to were, feel comfortable. Who were the other presenters at the time? So I landed when uh, Zoe was doing the breakfast show, I think. Jamie Zoe Theakston. Ball. Was, Zoe Ball, yeah. Jamie Theakston was doing a lunchtime show at the weekend. Um, Dave Pierce was doing drive time. And obviously you had a whole roster of um, Pete Tong, Judge Jules. Um, oh, uh, you know, uh, those guys. So the specialist guys were on mm -hmm. as well. D love John Peel was um, still very much on the network. I did some lovely shows from Glastonbury with John. Um, so, I mean, it, quite honestly, radio greats. And there's me who'd been on radio for three years. I, I mean, I, I genuinely, I felt like an imposter. It was a ridiculously fast trajectory to get from not doing radio or not having done radio in 97 to being on a national network by 2000. And, mm. I, and, and to be honest, the next few years were about me getting radio miles because I didn't have them. I just hadn't broadcast enough. Um, and that was that was an incredible process. And I th and I think really important to say that you are constantly learning. I'm still learning about broadcasting. I've now been doing it for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what I love about it. And of course, um, you've, you've done stuff on, on Radio 2, but you, you're now on Friday nights where you've been for quite a few years uh, on mm -hmm. Six Music. Um, how did you end up on Six Music? Which so, is, which, by the way, is the best radio station in the country. <laughs> you have to say that. I would play it later. Uh, I mean, it, it's like a playground. It is a wonderful station. I, I realised after a while that perhaps, you know, I think there are stages when radio stations change and Radio 1 reached one of those mid sort of noughties. And 
because I wasn't doing anything vastly different to Joe Wiley was doing the morning show. Edith was there with um, Colin in the lunchtime slot. There didn't seem to be a lot of room. And I was looking for places where I might be able to grow and do a kind of strip show permanently because I'd done the sort of weekends for a while and I'd covered a lot of the daytime. Um, and this and six started, uh, I think it was a year and a half before I went there and I'd been sort of watching this. It, originally, it was the home for uh, Peel sessions and, you know, music of that ilk. So it was very guitar led, although John Peel had a vast array of, of different genres that he liked to play. Uh, but initially it was very guitar led. It was quite male orientated. But they were branching out from, I think they'd initially sort of been a very small idea as a kind of offshoot to Radio One. But actually, in the end, I mean, when you say that six sits between one and two, it doesn't really cover it. It is a, a complete entity in its own right because it's, it, it supports independent music in a way that I think the other stations find difficult. No, you're, no, you're, right. you're absolutely right. And of course, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of your show because uh, um, even though even though I, I, I know what I'm doing you always drop tunes I've never heard before which is I like and you have some great guests and of course I've been a guest as well which is nice you but have. what what I like about what you do is um, you promote people on a national radio station that might get overlooked or give them the opportunity to get that airtime but then you couple that with covering for breakfast and covering for for other shows what's it like to to, to switch from doing your own show that you produce yourself to sitting in for someone else. How do you approach that? Well, I think uh, because I've been doing it for such a long time, I really, um, I actually quite like um, taking care of ba babysitting or kind of you yeah. know, keeping the seat warm. For, I, I, I actually, there's something really lovely in that. And I think um, I'm very lucky in the sense that I know all the presenters, I've been doing it a long time. So when I cover Lauren's show, the breakfast show, like you say, or the morning show, there's a kind of part of me that knows the sort of fabric of that show, but also feels able because I've been on the station for such a long time to bring some of, and the station is open to it, to bring some of myself. So I'm very lucky that I can marry what I'm doing on a Friday night, which is very electronic focused um, with some, some of the, my more broader tastes. But as you, you know, as you and I both know, I, we don't, I don't sit only in that electronic world. I have a vast music uh, taste and actually yes. that's what's lovely about doing daytime I get a chance to show that and even more now because I'm bringing the psychotherapy to which I've gone back and studied subsequently yeah um to, to daytime radio which has been uh, wonderful yeah well, I want to come to that in a minute but before we do um you, you've you've mentioned like Zoe Ball, Lauren Laverne um traditionally and this is something that I, I know that that, that you quite you got strong views on, but traditionally you entered an industry that was very male dominated uh -huh. and f female presenters tended to be part of a double act with, with, with a man on, on, on certainly on breakfast shows. Yes. But I did a few it, of those myself. <laughs> yes. Uh, but in recent years, especially the BBC and especially with six music and, and radio too, women have come to the fore more. What, what, what are your experiences as a woman in an industry that's changed a lot. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's changed immeasurably. It's got an inordinately long way to go. But I think um, we are reaching a stage now where, and, 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 it's, and it's wonderful, where it's just not acceptable not to have a more diverse, broad, you know, a, a kind of broadcast um, sort of roster that, that reflects the people that you're broadcasting to. I mean, to give you an example, when I first started, <laughs> okay, so when I first started to broach the subject of broadcasting, uh, one person working there who will remain nameless said to me, women, there is, a, there is a very strong piece of research that says that women don't like listening to women on the radio. <laughs> now I, I knew that that was- I love it. That was absolute bobbins because, because a man is standing there telling me as a woman that I might not like listening to women. And I knew that was utter rubbish. So I, I then was like, I am going to show you that that is not the case. But I don't think that was uh, an unheard of or, or sort of um, a, a niche thought. When I started in the mid 90s, there had been a piece of research. It was done years ago uh, and it was, uh, you know, and it was one thing. But I, uh, I think 
as we've grown as a kind of society to realize that actually it's just yeah it's just not acceptable to be as um uh, not representative as we perhaps have been um, and one thing i've noticed from what you've said in the past uh, 20 minutes or so is you strike me as someone who's been very proactive. So rather than just go go with the flow, you've said, right, the, uh, like you said, I, I don't think I'm going to fit in here anymore at Radio 1. So you've been very proactive and gone and come up with ideas and gone to find other things. Um, that, 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 that's obviously an important thing to do, isn't it? Well, I think having a... Uh, oh, you've not got to... comfy. You've never got comfy, have you? Well... I I don't know whether the industry allows you to get comfortable on the one hand. So that always felt I, I felt that pressure, not only from within, but kind of like, oh, you know, does my face fit here anymore? I think there's a lot of that in our world. And actually, I think part of um, giving yourself a bit more stability and a chance is to make sure you're doing different things. I mean, it's the old thing. Don't have all your eggs in one basket because you just don't know what's going to happen. But I, I and I I think. Um, especially being uh, now a slightly older female <laughs> in a world that is quite young, it, it struck me, especially at the time that I decided to go and study psychotherapy, that it wouldn't be a bad thing to have another skill. Uh, and it was something I always wanted to go back and do anyway. So there have been, as I'm, as I'm speaking to you, it probably sounds like there was a plan at certain stages to, to move on. It's never at the time, it doesn't necessarily feel like that. It's easy to draw that narrative now. So there's a bit of both. There's a bit of me that is constantly like, right, where am I? Is this okay? How long do I think this is gonna last? Do, where, where do I next need to look? Um, and there's a bit of me that does absolutely enjoy doing the shows that I'm doing for, for yeah. as long as I possibly can. I, I think that's probably true of uh, a lot of people in, in, in broadcasting. It's a combination of loving where you are, but always having, an eye out for, for what's happening around you. Otherwise, you don't want to get called into that meeting to say, thank you, but see you later, which which ha which happens at certainly in the independent sector a lot. OK, now, well, I think you also I think it's also just to just to say, um, you know, there's a there's a recognition that there are going to be younger people coming into the industry. It has to be more fluid. Mm. It can't be. And, and this is the same for music as well. It can't always be the same people. You have to kind of, uh, you know, we don't make way in, in the kind of in, in some sense for the next generation. Where are they going to go if we're still working in the same space we were before? I think it's part of allowing a space for people to grow into. Exactly. Now, let's talk about um your psychotherapist uh, role, if that's all right. Um, sure. Ob obviously, going back to do something that you well, do something that you trained for, and you have a website, and you are a trained uh, psychotherapist. How does that sit alongside your uh, broadcasting career? Uh, do you know it just does, Graham? At the moment, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure how. And um, I didn't know when I uh, applied to study psychotherapy, whether it could sit alongside. I mean, it was very much, so I started studying 2012, 2013, and I had been looking around for courses prior to that in terms of, it, I couldn't necessarily work out which was my best route in. Uh, and I did a foundation course in psychotherapy to begin with, but after I'd had the kids and after I you know, felt able to go back, I, it was great to get my brain ticking over and to work out whether it's what I wanted to do. And it's it's not inexpensive, as your students will know, to go on and to, to do further education. So I had to work out whether it was something I thought I could do. Um, and initially, I didn't know whether I'd have to give up more radio. I mean, in a way, they've sort of knocked along. Okay, I mean, sometimes if I am doing well, certainly when I was writing essays and studying during the course, and I was called in to do breakfast, I had a frantic week. I mean, it was literally like wall to wall, barely any rest. And I'm lucky, I had a really, really um, supportive network around me that enabled me to do both. Um, at, at, and I am hugely grateful to my partner, to my kids, to my family to, 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 to help me do that because it, otherwise I think it would have been really difficult to keep both going. But I'm wondering if you've got a successful broadcasting career, um, why would you say, oh, I want to go and do psychotherapy? 
Be, well, for me, because at the, well, I, I don't know whether you remember when I said earlier, I was pursuing um, clinical psychology as I heard that first advert on KISS. And at the time, I kind of figured, you know what, I'm not sure I've got enough life experience. I am ah. 21, 22. I would like to do more therapy and kind of psycho psychology with people. But do I really know what I'm talking about? Do I not have to live live a bit now? I don't think it's always true that a younger generation can't be, you know, can't do psychotherapy or, or psychology. Plenty of people can. I needed to go and live a little bit and I needed to work and have some life experience. And I knew that in my heart of hearts. And then when the radio, when I fell in love with the radio station, that was it. I'd found home. But I always had this little bit of this kind of niggle of like, well, at some point I'll go back and do this. And it wasn't until I, you know, like I said, I'd, I'd really grounded. So the first 10, 15 years in radio, I was DJing and working, you know, partying and having a great time and enjoying my job. Um, and then when I became more settled with a family and I was working, that was the point at which it felt like I could go and lift the lid on Pandora's box. Because, of course, when you do therapy and study psychotherapy, you go through that process yourself. So I, I, I knew I had to be in a certain place to kind of go and do that. Um, now, you mentioned podcasts earlier. Uh, and it is a, a growing area. And uh, like you're right, anyone can make a podcast about anything. Yeah. And techno technology is a big part of that. Just like making music, it's much easier to make music. It's much easier to 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 make a, a radio show or a podcast. Have you made any podcasts where you've combined music and psychotherapy, or have you just done one or the other? And 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 in the podcast you've done, what what are your like top tips for people who are watching this who might be thinking about or making their own podcast? Well, I am in the process of designing a couple of podcasts, doing just that. So combining music and therapy. Um, and I think I, I, it, it, it's of course it's, um, you know, it, it has been done, but maybe not quite like this and not by someone who's a DJ and a therapist. So I bring that to it. There's something fresh. I mean, I was going to say the podcast landscape is noisy, isn't it? There is so much out there. But if you have an idea that feels really authentic and that you can, um, you know, translate into spoken words and with a bit of music, if you want, um, I think it will find an audience. So I think it has to be you have to be kind of certain about what you're trying to say, certain about who you're trying to say it to um, and then kind of weave the narrative. Um, and like you said, it's so much easier to make it these days so, so you just need a mic and garage band effectively a mic and garage band exactly or i mean there's loads of stuff audacity oh. is a free thing that you can use yeah. um but obviously with your broadcasting background you know the importance of uh planning everything in advance uh having a great script having great questions for your interviewees and obviously you know a bit about editing how important is all of that when you, you said you need a mic and a garbage band? Yes, but then yes, you do absolutely. But the, but the, but I, but, but the prep is going to make the finished thing better, isn't it? I would not approach anything that I intended to broadcast without an enormous, well, a huge amount of prep. And I think there's sometimes the feeling that some of these shows sound like they're done on the hoof and that they're made from someone's kitchen table and they've just pressed record and they're just chatting. And sometimes it will have been. But some of the most successful shows that sound like they're done on the hoof incorporate an unimaginable amount of work. And I'll tell you one great example of this is Mark and uh, um, Mark Riley and Mark Radcliffe's show. They were Mark and Lard, weren't they, on Radio 1? So they were Mark and Lard on Radio 1. Yeah. yeah, so they were end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. They did a lunchtime show on Radio 1. It sounded so um, like they were just making it up as they went along. It was kind of chaotic, what, yeah. It sounded hugely chaotic. And it was just must listen radio. I mean, you never quite knew what was going to happen. You never quite knew what one, one or the other was going to stay, what that was going to then, um, you know, lead to. Uh, they had great, they had a great following and they used to work at that show. So they went on air. I think it was 12 till two, something like that, or one till three. And they had worked. Three, oh yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. They had worked from eight o'clock in the morning till one o'clock. And I know this because I used to see them in BBC Manchester uh, and they would be working nonstop on the show that went out. And not only that, at three o'clock, they'd then they'd then be prepping for the next day. And then the same thing would happen again. It just it I, I thought it was the best example of something that sounds chaotic and fresh and not really prepped that absolutely is nailed down to uh, the script, what they're going to say, what the content is who's going to speak when, the questions obviously for the guests, they're, they're hugely important. I mean, I, I wouldn't um, ever approach an interview without having done research on my guest because it's not, you know, uh, it, it just doesn't feel great. And you want to feel, I think some of the guests that I've interviewed have said, oh, oh you really know what you're talking about. And actually, if somebody mm. demonstrates that they know something about you, much like you've, you've done with me today, then I, I feel in safe hands and I feel okay to speak. And that's when you're going to get the best interviews out of people. <laughs> safe hands. Okay, let's, let's hope that continues. Um, <laughs> They're safe. Who's... They're safe, Graham. No, but that, you're right. Preparation is the key for everything. Um, out of all the people you've interviewed, who's kind of your favourite and who's like the kind of some of the big stars that you actually had to pinch yourself and go, I can't believe I'm interviewing this person? Oh, I mean... Uh, there's been uh, over the years because I've done lots of different shows there's been everybody from all walks of life I met um Arnold Schwarzenegger who had wow. been incredible he was incredibly short which I wasn't expecting because obviously on screen he's massive yeah uh, he just, I mean it was it was it was not for the, the first Terminators but it was for subsequent ones and he was I was just like oh okay he was literally <laughs> like, was like eye height with Terminator really? thinking, oh, right um Got massive hands, huge right. hands. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Eric Cantona I, I, as a Man United fan. I'm afraid I lost him. Oh, really? Um, okay. Whilst I was pregnant with my second baby, and and he did actually place his wow. hands on the bump, which I really, which I asked, I asked him to. It was it was fine. Uh, which I felt I've always said to Bass, oh, you know, you have actually sort of met Eric Cantona. <laughs> um, uh, Julie Julie Walters and Helena Bonham Carter, I think two of my absolute favorite from from that kind of more acting world um I mean on the music front early doors I did interview Buster Rhymes incredible kind of interview um bit chaotic at the time because it was latter end of the 90s so he was still very much in party mode uh Pharrell Williams <laughs> fell asleep on wow. me twice not on fell me, asleep on you yeah on the interview twice oh sorry not um, on you right okay no 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 not on me <laughs> During the interview, um, at, I mean, he said jet lag, but when it happened the second time, I, I actually said to him, this is the second time you've fallen asleep on me. I think first time, you know, easy mistake to make. Second time, I must just be boring you. Um, the boy, oh, actually I had a couple of expletives in two interviews that went out on the BBC. One was the Foo Fighters, which was Taylor, uh, Taylor Hawkins and Dave Grohl, who got so comfortable, they were just, effing and jeffing and I had to kind of go uh, ooh, ooh, that really difficult really sorry if you might be um offended by the language they were just having a good time I mean it was a lovely interview and the same thing happened with Matt from Muse backstage at um V Festival I think it was uh or, or Le uh, Reading and Leeds as it was then um who yeah just got carried away of course that that brings you on to the difference between live radio and pre-recorded um programs so yeah how do you, I mean, how do you cope with, obviously you've got to remember the, the Ofcom guidance, haven't you? If somebody swears on air, yeah. um, but how do, you, how do you deal with someone, say a live guest who's either swearing or maybe a live guest who's not really giving you what you want and it's hard work. How do you, um, how do you cope with that? I mean, it's, um, well, I mean, it, 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 you know, as you would in any sort of interaction or relationship, you're kind of thinking on your feet and you're like, oh, OK. Uh, I mean, I, I often think actually in that situation, if you're still polite and, you know, you're trying your best to get a, a, a nice interview and you're kind of asking great questions, it, often people can tell 
that the the difficulty is coming from the guest not you know it's like actually you can only try so hard I can't make them speak if they don't want to speak I can't make them tell me anything interesting but it really is about feeling your way and I, I by and large I've had a smile out of most people um but there are some interviews that you work really hard at and you'll hear if I am talking a lot mm. and sort of then you get the line share of if you've got more to moan than you have guests, then you've probably had a bit more of a tricky interview because I am then almost kind of filling in the gaps. But that's when it really helps to have done your research. Because yes, of at course. some point you will hit something where they go, oh, God, you know that. OK. And that might but provide the difference. What about the other side? If you if you ask someone a question and say you say, well, we've got we've got like a three minute section of the show. And you ask a question and they are off and you can't stop them. How would you stop someone? I mean, that's, if you're recording, fine. You edit it down. Yeah, you, amazing. you edit it down, yeah. But if it's yeah. live and the clock's ticking and you've got to go to the news, how would you politely get out of something like that? Well, that's interesting because that is about boundaries, isn't it? And that actually comes into the therapy room as well. So if I ah. have somebody who is talking a lot... Um, you know, evidently it's a it's a, a kind of a happy medium between allowing somebody to speak and say what they've got to say, but also bearing in mind the boundaries that you have. Like you say, if, I've, if it's the clock is ticking down towards the news and the news is getting pushed further and further towards, uh, you know, away from the time that it should be, then at some point I'm going to have to butt in and say, look, that's been fascinating. And, and actually you would, if somebody was really in the flow and had something to say, you might go, do you know what? We're going to come back to this after the news because this is so brilliant. Let's carry on. You know, you just kind Brilliant. of you're, you're kind of um, using what you've got and thinking on your feet, and then you know you can you'd carry it on after that. It might not be the done thing, but it would certainly work. Okay, well, I've got a couple of questions from students here. Sure, if that's yeah. all right. So, uh, Max, um, if Max is, is going to switch his mic and his camera on, uh, assuming he's paying attention, if I can hear him, so. Uh, Max, Hello. what's your question? What's your question for Hi, the morning? Hi, Max. Hi. Right. Um, what was it that particularly interested you in being a presenter? And also, what was it like um, transitioning from being a receptionist to with a degree in psychology to later being someone who would design their own show? So you know, Namone's Electric Ladyland. Do you know, uh, Max, interesting on the what wanted, what kind of made me want to be a presenter. I think in the beginning, I actually wanted to be a DJ. So I wanted to do what Graham used to do. And I didn't I still really, do it. Uh, yes, what well, Graham still does. I didn't really want to speak, actually. It took me a long time to realise that actually the spoken part was going to be as important and to hone that sort of skill. So I was absolutely a music kind of fiend to begin with. And the speech and the presentation of that kind of came later. Um, but, and, and actually I enjoyed it. Do you know, I enjoy talking about music and sharing my love of that. And I think that's probably um, come through in most of the broadcasting I've done. And then designing a show was like being a child in a sweetie shop. I mean, given the, given the chat, well, I mean, essentially, I um that show actually came out of them moving on six music the breakfast shows at the weekend to Manchester and to, to Salford sorry and I actually couldn't go with that show and I was like well what can I what what show might they need on six music that I might be able to present that means that I can still work for the station that I love and actually I I, I came up with Electric Ladyland and that um it, at the time, we certainly weren't playing as much electronic music on the station. So I was looking around for what might be missing off the network. Uh, and, and that was it. Does, does that Brilliant. answer your question? Yeah, that answers it. Um, also, um, I won't keep you too long. Uh, one more thing. Um, yeah. I um, did a bit of research and um, just correct me if I'm wrong. Are you from Chester? I am from, I was born in Chester, yeah, yeah, in Cheshire and spent my first 10 years in Chester, yeah. Oh, I just had to get that off my chest because I'm from Chester as well. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. All the best people yes. in Chester. Big up, Excellent. the Northwest, definitely. Well, thank <laughs> nice you. Nice to meet you.
thank you, Max. Now we have Good luck, got, Max. We've got Callum. Callum's uh, got a question for you in the morning. Now, Callum, if, if you can put your mic and camera on, and Hi, hopefully, Hi, here he is. Off, over to you, Callum. Hi, Callum. Uh, well, I, I was going to ask about um, like difficulties you've had, like getting into your career, but you've kind of already asked that, so I kind of want to ask. Um, you, you talked about. Uh, like uh, interviewing Matt Bellamy, um, yeah, I'm like I'm a big Muse fan. You've talked about um, uh, interviewing uh, Buster Rhymes. Like, what what music are you into? Because like you've talked about all these different artists, and I like I love all these artists. So, what music are you like? What is your like favorite band or your favorite artist? Oh my god! I mean, that question would change on a daily basis. Can you see the shelves behind yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. So they're all the vinyl, and actually, a lot of my music is now here on this laptop because um, the music that I get sent for Electric Ladyland is is largely all uh, MP3s or WAVs, and I put them into. So I've got a huge library on here as well. Um, I'm thinking as you. I mean, when I'm asked who my favourite artist is, I've got to say Prince. So we had this we had this discussion in the family the other day, like, who would you say? And I'm like, yeah, Prince, if I was asked right put on the spot. Uh, and Sign of the Times is probably my favourite, uh, uh, favourite album, uh, um, Purple Rain track. But I mean, I was looking at Daft Punk today for I'm um, scheduling New Year's Eve for six music. And I'm like, oh, can I go from Daft Punk? I want to play some Grace Jones. So I've got a great remix done um, by a DJ that I love of her track. Um, I... I have a, a love of 90s hip hop. So if there's kind of beats and breaks involved, I love drum and bass. High Contrast did the mix for me last week on the show. Oh my, if you haven't had a chance yeah. to listen to that, go and listen to it. It is, it's brilliant. And he made a track with Kay Tempest in the summer uh, that's on his new album that came out this month that is, it's blinding drum and bass and she sounds wicked. And I love Kay Tempest. I mean, I know it sounds like a kind of jumping all over the place, but but that is the music that I love. I mean, I, I, I do love a lot of different music. Muse, I played, I didn't play Butterflies and Hurricanes recently, but we played something when I was in Falamo a couple of weeks ago and it sounded gorgeous. So yeah, I mean- <laughs> From the new album? No, it was from it was from the era, kind of 2000 era. And it was, just, it was more mellow. Oh, it's lovely, lovely Muse. Yeah. Uh, you you remind me very much of myself because I I'm I bobbing around in different genres all the time. So it, it's nice to see that you, you're like that as well. Yeah. Oh, I think do, do, Callum just it, always try and keep hold of that because I think much less these days are people trying to put people in boxes. And I think you can combine different music uh, really effectively. So just keep that up. Keep kind of bringing that into Definitely, whatever you're yeah. making. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Callum. And and just to follow up what the Moon said, you're absolutely right. Um, the Moon, it's all about having eclectic tastes. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think these days less than less. When we first started out, it felt like you were thought of as a house DJ, or yeah. and even even more than that, a kind of happy house, hands in the air house and, and a techno DJ. Now yeah. you can have everything in a set. And I love no, that. Exactly. I mean, I, I much prefer that. And I think people respond to that as well. No, I, I'm with you on that. I absolutely love mixing it up, you know. And uh, uh, oh, Carlos has uh, got a question. He, he says he wants me to ask it on, on his behalf. Um, yeah. He asks, um, how did it feel to be able to create and design your own show, Electric Ladyland. Would you do it again, since it's a bit different from being a DJ? Well, I mean, you're still on. It's now the six mix, isn't it? But it's yeah, essentially yeah, um, the same. It's essentially the same show. I mean, I, I, how did it feel to be able to design it? It just, it felt like the show that was kind of screaming out to be made almost for six. It felt, I mean, I've always felt that it would sit quite nicely after Craig Charles Funk and Soul show on a Saturday night. Cause I think then yeah. you have like a sweep of, and I, and I, there's nothing against being after Ravers on it, Tom Ravenscroft show. Cause I love that as well. So I think it's, it's a, it's a great time of night to be on as well, but it, it did feel like that late night home for, as you've said, electronic music that is not getting played anywhere else. And it really isn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. I think there's even more necessity for that in this day and age because um, electronic music has blossomed in a way I don't think any of us could have envisaged 20 years ago and it's no. still going strong. And if 
anything, it feels like it has taken the indie guitar mantle from the UK and it's now electronic music that we're kind of renowned mm. for. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, the importance of a show like that feels, uh, I feel really grateful to have been able to, to, to make Electric Ladyland and to still be doing it in some form. How, how has the, the, obviously the pandemic since March has kind of messed everything up for everyone, particularly the live sector, but it's also affected how um, you've probably had to approach broadcasting and, and, and doing your show. So um, I'm sure like me, you miss going to a field in the summer and playing great music to like-minded people. Um, but how, how, how has the pandemic affected the way you work since March? Uh, I mean, immeasurably. There's no, I, I make um, Electric Lady Land, the six mix from here. So I have the mic that I'm using now for talking to you guys that I record my links on. I have, I don't, you, I don't know if you can see it. I've got my decks just right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so I mix great sort of chunks of the music and then we mix them together. And the show is entirely made from here. Now, before March, I don't think anyone would have said that that was OK, certainly in the BBC. And that's not because they didn't want it. It's just because no one had fathomed out that it was possible. Um, and, and, and actually, obviously, we didn't know what the quality was going to be like. So um, I uh, initially they had to use all the resources for daytime broadcasting on six music. So initially I wasn't making new shows and they were playing out repeats of, of Ladyland's, say, April and May. And then I was really pushing that, like, saying, look, we can do this. We, I can make it from home. The producer says he can actually help in terms of editing and listening to the tracks and complying it let's do it uh, uh, and that has it, we've been able to move completely to the new world uh, and make the show like that and the same actually with psychotherapy so i had done some sessions online with people before but i never would have imagined that you could keep the depth of relationship in this kind of way um from working online and you can i've had all my clients move online and i am still working with them all now that, that that's interesting because uh, one of the modules I teach students are are making a podcast as a group. And normally, in normal yeah. times, they're in the classroom together. They meet they're up together, and, yeah. and they go out with mics and recorders, and they use the equipment in the in the building to to do it. But they're having to make this podcast remotely, and some of them I've never met because, like Max is in Chester. Uh, We've got some who live in the, the East Midlands, the West Midlands and all over the yeah. place. So it can be done. We just got to adapt, haven't you? Well, I think it's been it's been done in music for a long time because artists have collaborated globally on tracks without ever having met without ever having met. And mm. we don't al always realize that that's the case. You know, you've got a vocalist who's in the States, you've got a producer in the UK and they have made a track together. So really we're, we're playing catch up with that, but it is absolutely possible because um, as long as you're open to speaking like this and, and you know everything that comes with that. But I was thinking for students, it's been really difficult. It's such a difficult landscape to be studying in because you're not meeting Graham on a weekly basis, face to face like you normally would, but you can meet like this. You might want to set up kind of study buddy groups or kind of just keep in touch with one or two people. So you've got support there, because I think that's the main thing as well. You've not got that. Oh, can we grab a coffee in the cafe afterwards? Or, you know, none of that's there at the moment. Um, so anything you can do to keep in touch, uh, maybe a WhatsApp group for the for the class mm. or, or kind of between people just to keep that contact is really important, I think. And, and just to kind of wrap things up just to go back to your psychotherapist role um a lot of students are just getting on with remote working and, and not interacting in person but a few that i've spoken to are maybe struggling a bit and it's it's an odd it's not so bad for the if it's if it's if you're a first year or a foundation student you just get on with it but some who are returning or or, or some who just can't get to grips with it what advice would you give to someone who's kind of maybe you know working at home on their own and not having that human contact yeah i think it's i think it's really really challenging um i would i would try and kind of just promote the chance to talk to you or somebody at the college um at the university i know there's a student information desk 
on the website of the university and that takes you through to a counselling service so if you do want to talk to someone and you're struggling that is there available for the university but I was thinking if if people are struggling you can um talk to Graham and then perhaps Graham you could put people together in exactly. touch to say actually perhaps you can work together or here's somebody who um you know you know you might be able to talk to who is also in the same position because I think often we think we're the only one who's going through it and um I have to say exactly. I've experienced that in my DJ career because often DJs at radio stations don't see each other because they're doing shows that are kind of disparately timed so uh it was only ever Christmas parties that I'd get together with people at Radio One and I'd be like oh you actually exist and I can talk to you and then um and then you say hi and actually find out that they're feeling a bit lost and a bit you know not really knowing what's going on as well so I think the importance of uh, really reaching out if they can uh, uh, and then finding that support uh, would be good. Brilliant. And I can't believe you, you, you've talked about the importance of researching you, the person you're interviewing and you've just proved to me that you've even researched our website before you came on to this show. <laughs> That's very, very impressive. Of course. Work. So listen, Namon, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experiences and advice with our students on this Creative Future session for Gwindu University. Namon, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'd love to come back and, and also ask questions. If there's something that you didn't ask today, send me an email, I'll try and answer it.